Now let's pray as we look at the word today. Father, thank you for your precious word that never returns void, but is always working in us to change us and transform us to be more like your son. And we just pray, Father, that as we look at this, your Holy Spirit will give me the words to, to bless your people and to give them the message that you have for, for the whole body today. And Lord, may you just um, encourage, challenge, bless, make us more like Jesus, and help us to receive what you have for us today. We love you because you first loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we're going to go to Genesis, back to Genesis, I should say. Um, we've been doing a faith series, and, um, and I interrupted the, that series, kind of, because anytime you preach on Jesus and the resurrection and crucifixion, you're preaching on faith. So <laughs> I just can't really say we interrupted it, but we're going back to Jacob, where we were uh, before we, we hit the Easter holiday. And uh, Genesis chapter 32 <clears throat> Now keep in mind that um, where we're at in this particular passage is Jacob has already left to return back home with his family. He's already had his encounter with Laban, and um, they've already agreed not to harm each other and to go their separate ways, okay? So I'm just going to kind of read it. We're going to stop at different points during the reading of the text and just notice some things uh, along the way here. Um, it says, in, in beginning with verse 1 of chapter 32, Now as Jacob went on his way, the angels of God met him. Jacob said, when he saw them, this is God's camp. So he named that place Manim, which can mean two camps or two companies. Now I'm going to stop right there already because it doesn't tell us anything more about that. I just, want, I just want to point out, it's interesting, when, when Jacob left home to go to Pedernarum, God met him on the way, Bethel, and the, the angels ascended and descended on the ladder, and he had his encounter with God, and, and that, that was in, in, in Genesis chapter 28, and, and in that particular place, he told God, if you'll keep me, and, and it, if God will be with me and keep me on this journey, I take and will give me food to eat and garments to wear. I return to my father's house and say to me that the Lord will be my God. The stone which I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. So he, he has an encounter with God and, and God <coughs> has spoken to him very clearly and said he would be with him. And, and um, interesting, you know, in this case, he, he shows up, he's headed back home, and he knows he's going to encounter Esau. And, of course, Esau, when he left, one of the reasons he left home, one of the primary reasons he left home is because Esau wanted to kill him because he had stolen his blessing and his birthright. And, and so he, he's nervous. The angels show up, and we have no idea what their conversation was. Uh, we, we really don't know what took place. i got to believe it was more than, hi there, Jacob. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's the angels again. You know, they're, they're, I think something went on. Something transpired. Some conversation probably took place that, that we don't really know about. And obviously it's not a critical detail or they would have included it in, in the text. But I just want to point that out. Let's go to verse 3. It says, Then Jacob sent messengers before him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. He also commanded him, saying, Thus you should say to my lord Esau, Thus says your servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed... Oh. I've sojourned with Laban and stayed until now. I have oxen and donkeys and flocks and male and female servants, and I have sent to tell my Lord that I may find favor in your sight. So the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to your brother Esau, and furthermore, he's coming to meet you, and 400 men are with him. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people with, who were with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels and the two companies. For he had said, if Esau comes to the one company and attacks it, then the company which is left will escape. Okay, so right there we see interesting, there's no indication of a prayer at first, okay? Because he, he, he um, 
simply is using his, his own ideas or wisdom, I, and unless the angels told him to do something, but it doesn't say that. He sends his messengers to Esau, and then you got to know that it's going to terrify him when he finds not only is Esau coming, but 400 men. Why does he need an army with him? You know, why does Esau need an army? And, and, and you wonder what Esau's intention was. I guess we don't know what his intention was. Was he trying to intimidate? Him? Was he trying? Maybe initially Esau wanted to destroy. Him. Maybe, maybe the steps that Jacob took helped to appease Esau and soften his heart by the time they actually reached each other. But we don't, we don't really know. He might have maybe just wanted to kind of pay, pay him back by making him tremble in his boots a little bit. And in verse 9, it says, Jacob said, this is where he starts praying. Okay? He finds out that Esau and these 400 men are coming, and it's time to pray. Jacob says, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, so he's going to remind God of his promise, return to your country and to your relatives, and I will prosper you. Well, he can't, God can't prosper Jacob if he's dead. Okay, so he's reminding him uh, of that special word. He said, I am unworthy of all the loving kindness and of all the faithfulness which you have shown to your servant. For with my staff only, I crossed this Jordan, and now I have become two companies. So we see that he's coming back, a very humble man um, at, at this point. <clears throat> Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, that he will come and tell me and the mothers with the children. For you said, there it is, another reminder, you said, I will surely prosper you and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which is too great to be numbered. Never hurts to, to throw up a prayer. I don't think God is offended when we throw up a prayer and remind him of his promises. Remind him of his word. You promised to be with us. Thank you that you're with us. Thank you, God, that you can bring us through whatever we face. In verse 13, he says, so he spent the night there. Then he selected from what he had with him a present for his brother Esau. 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 ewes, and 20 rams, 30 milking camels, their colts, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys, and 10 male goats. He delivered them in the hand of his servants, every drove by itself, and said to his servants, pass on before me and put a space between droves. So he's got this plan here on, on how he's going to appease his brother and soften his heart. And, he, he commanded the one in front, saying, When my brother Esau meets you and asks you, saying to me, To whom do you belong, and where are you going, and to whom do these animals in front of you belong, then you shall say, These belong to your servant Jacob. It is a present sent to my lord Esau. And behold, he also is behind us. Then he commanded also the second and the third, and also those who follow the drove, saying, After this manner you shall speak to Esau, when you find them, you shall say, Behold, your servant Jacob also is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goes before me. Then afterward, I will see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. So the present passed on before him while he himself spent that night in the camp. Now he arose that same night and took his two wives, his two maids, and his eleven children and crossed the fort of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and he sent across whatever he had. Okay, so we see, we see that um, Jacob is, he's been making plans here. He's, he's sent up um, all these gifts ahead to Esau to soften his heart and prepare him for the encounter when he was going to meet him. And then he, he takes his wives his maids, his eleven children, they cross the ford of the, the river. And he sent he sends them across the stream. And it says that he was left alone. It, it, it seems like Jacob knew that God had business to do with him. I don't know whether the angels, you know, had told him, you know, God, you're gonna have an encounter. You know, God has something to, to say to you. I I really don't know because we don't know what they said, but I still believe something took place there other than a friendly greeting by um, some angels. And, um, but somehow Jacob knew that it was time to spend some time with God. Otherwise, he would have just went with his family. 
So he sends him across the river. It says that Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. To me, this is one of the strangest passages in the Old Testament. Okay, just the, the idea of God wrestling with man, actually wrestling with him and, until daybreak. How many, how many of you were wrestlers in your younger years? <laughs> okay, I wrestled in, in junior high. That, that was, so I, it just, I had this image in my head and, and it's just hard to, to, to shake. And, uh, he said he wrestled with him until daybreak. So they, they wrestled for a long time during the night. Jacob was was wrestling with God. He was he was struggling with him. And he and, and um, it says when he saw that he had not prevailed against him, okay, he touched the socket of that be Jacob's thigh. So the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. What thought comes to me? If you end up with dislocated and socket in your hip, what's the first thing you're going to feel? Pain. 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 Lots, lots of it. Lots of pain. Okay. So you know, Jake, Jacob is having. Apparently, God has made Himself in such a way that that He can wrestle with man. And we know that God took on human form in, in different places. And and. and Scholars almost across the board, almost every, everywhere I read, they believe that this was very likely Jesus, okay, in his pre-incarnate state, taking on human form um, and, 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 and wrestling with him. And, and even though Jacob thought he could match him, you know, all it took was a little touch, you know, and, and, and it was over. I'm, I'm going to pause right there. I want to read a, a passage from Hosea that describes this wrestling match just a little bit. Gives a little bit more insight into it. It says, the, the Lord, in Hosea chapter 12, says, The Lord also has a dispute with Judah and will punish Jacob according to his ways. He will repay him according to his deeds. In the womb, he took his brother by the heel. And in his maturity, he contended with God. Yes, he wrestled with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought his favor. He found him at Bethel, and there he spoke with us. Even the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord is his name. Notice it says that he wrestled with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought his favor. He wept and sought his favor. There's an intensity going on. That, that, that kind of adds a little bit more to the picture here. But it says that, that he touched the socket, so the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. So whether this is Jesus or whether this is an angel, he said, let me go, the dawn is breaking. But Jacob says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man has a dislocated hip. He's in pain, but he's weeping and crying out and saying, I will not let you go unless you bless me. He's afraid. He's getting ready to meet his brother. He's worried about being destroyed. And he has an encounter with God and God's presence. And he doesn't want to let go until he receives the blessing. It reminds me of the, the passage where it says, ask, seek, and knock. The passage that talk about persisting in prayer. You know, going to, to God again and again and again, never giving up. Always believing that he's listening, but he's, he's sometimes waiting for us to be desperate enough, desperate enough, and have the faith enough to keep coming back to his throne and believing that he wants to bless us. But Jacob refused to let go, even though all it took was a touch. He was already in pain. All it took was a touch. He was no match for God. He said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. It's not that God didn't know his name. <laughs> He's making a point here. He said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Israel, by the way, can mean 
and fuse Christ with God, but it also can be Prince of God, a, a Prince who is with God. Okay. Then Jacob asked him and said, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed me. So Jacob named the place Peniel, for he said, I have seen God face to face. This is why the scholars believe this was probably more than just an angel. Sometimes the, the presence of the Lord seems to be referred to as an angel, like a spirit being. Um, in, in, in the Old Testament, he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been preserved. Now the sun rose upon him just as he crossed over Peniel, and he was limping on his thigh. Therefore, to this day, the sons of Israel do not eat the snail of the hip, which is on the socket of God, because he touched the socket of Jacob's thigh in the snail of the hip. So he had a, a, a reminder, a physical reminder of his encounter with God. But what I, what I wanted to just focus just for a moment on is, is his encounter with God, his wrestling with God resulted in a change in identity. And that's what God is after with us. That's really what he's after with us. A change in our identity. Jacob wrestled with man and with God. He wrestled with his brother, he contended with his brother, he was a deceiver. He, he, and, and yet God kept coming to him to work a change in him. Came to him as he was going to, to Peyton Aaron. And then and he had a dream while he was in Peyton Aaron. And then God finally told him. So God kept speaking off and on in his life over a period of time. And now he encounters God. And, and he's been contending with his brother. He's still contending with his brother because he doesn't know what's going to happen. But now he's going to contend with God. He's going to have an encounter with God and wrestling with God. And, and he hangs on to God. He hangs on to his presence. He refuses to let go, and he asks him to bless him. He said, I won't let go until you bless me. I'm desperate for this blessing. And God blesses him by changing his name from Jacob, the deceiver, to Israel, the prince who is with God. Israel, the prince who is with God. We wrestle. We wrestle. This is the point I want to make. Because I... So, so often, I think, for us, we, we understand that we, have, we, we all are we're sinners in need of the grace of Jesus. And we understand when we come to him in faith and repentance and, and we're baptized into him that he gives us, uh, he, he washes our sins away. He fills us with his presence. But sometimes we miss the identity change that he's trying to work in us. We, we ask his blessing, but the blessing he wants to give us isn't just more things. The blessing he wants to give us is a new identity. He wants us to see ourselves as he sees us. Because there's power in that. There's power in that kind of a transformation and change taking place. So if you go to the, the New Testament and you look at how the Bible refers to Christians, those who belong to Christ, how, how it looks at them again and again, especially when you look at like Paul's letters, when he's writing letters, he says to the saints who are at this location, at Rome, or the saints at Corinth, or the saints, saints, he, there's been a change in identity. We not only are saved by the blood of Jesus, forgiven and cleansed, but we're given a new identity. You know, the, the, I know there's a bumper sticker out there that says, I'm, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. And, and really, past tense, we were sinners. Now, our new identity is saints. We're, we, God does not want us to see ourselves as sinners because if you see that as your identity, that would be your tendency. He wants to see us, he wants to see ourselves as new identity of holy, righteous, perfect saints in Christ. That's an important clarification because I don't walk around with a halo on my head, okay? <laughs> you know, and the Bible says if you say you're without sin, then you're a liar, okay? We, 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 do, we do sin from time to time. And he's faithful and just to cleanse us. But here's the thing. 
He covers us with Jesus. All who are baptized in him have clothed themselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Romans, Paul said that we need to clothe ourselves so we are clothed, but then each day we need to clothe ourselves again with his presence. But we are given this identity of being covered with Jesus, with his perfection, his righteousness, his holiness. And so the Father looks at us, sees his Son covering us, and he calls us holy ones, saints, priests of God, friends of God. Our identity is changed. And when we begin to understand that change in identity, it begins to help us to have victory in this life. That there's too many people that believe in Jesus, and, and even though they come to Jesus, they continue to see their identity as that of sinner. That's not your identity anymore if you're in Christ. You are a saint who occasionally sins, and, he, and you are forgiven. You're a saint, a holy one. And he wants us to walk into that identity. He wants us to, to, to see ourselves as he does, as precious children of God. 1 John chapter 3, one of my favorite passages. 1 John chapter, chapter 3. Somebody took 1 John out of my Bible. Here it is. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us. I, the, the, the New International Version says, how great, a, see how great a love the Father has lavished on us. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, lavished on us, that we should be called, what are we called? What's, what's that passage, Amy? Children. children. Children of God. Children of God. And such we are. For this reason the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God. It has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. And everyone who has his hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. The Bible again and again and again, the, the, the New Testament writers refer to us as children of God as priests of God. We are royalty. We are royalty because we have been adopted into a royal family. Does that make sense? And this is not a small thing. It's huge. Most of us, well, maybe not you, but me, let's say I went a long time not understanding this. A long time not understanding this. A long time not seeing myself as, as, as a sinner who is saved, but still as a sinner. And God doesn't want us to see ourselves that way. He wants us to see the righteousness and purity that Jesus has imputed to us and put upon us. To see this new identity that we have as his children so that we will tend towards that identity. And I say, if you, if you tell your kid, you're a loser, 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 they, they'll grow up thinking of themselves as losers. Okay? It, it's... It's the identity is important because it affects the way you think. And we need to see ourselves as full of the presence of God. Saints, holy ones, who occasionally sin but are forgiven by the grace and love and mercy of Jesus Christ. We need to see ourselves as having the presence of God in us and among us, moment by moment, day by day, so that with Paul, we'll say, I have been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He said, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Paul, Paul understood this identity principle and he understood it. It was no longer him living, but Christ living in him. But you have to understand that and begin to grasp it and begin to ask for it. More of him living in us. And when there's more of him living in us, it'll affect the way we treat other people, the way we respond to people, the way we love people. It'll affect our faith so that we'll begin to believe. I can pray for a person that's needing prayer right now. I don't have to be a pastor. I don't have to be an elder. I'm his child. I'm royalty. I can pray for this person. 
And the presence of God can touch them. The presence of God can release healing and, and can release blessing and peace and love and whatever he wants to release. We are powerful people because we have the powerful presence of God in us. Jacob wrestled with God and then he stood amazed when he said, I've seen God face to face and lived. One day we're going to see him face to face. Yeah. We're going to see him face to face. It's going to be wonderful. Glorious. I look forward to it. Uh, it's usually when I say that, somebody says, but I'm not trying to rush it. <laughs> well, I look forward to it. Right, let's, let's stand and, and, and pray. I just want to close with that. So, uh, if you want to extend your hands to receive blessing, I'm going to ask the Lord to bless you. You know what your needs are and, and, and how you'd like the Lord to touch you, but Jesus is here. Where he is, there's power for anything he wants to do. There's resurrection power in this room. Father, thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ here this morning. Your children. Lord, I pray this message will sink into their heart and they'll begin to see that you are proud of them and you love them, that you are, they are holy and they're, they're saints and they're priests of God. They're royalty. They're your children. Your word even says they are seated with you in the heavenlies, already seated with you in the heavenlies in some mystical sense that's hard for us to comprehend. But we're right there with you. And your presence is here, Jesus. You said, where two or three come together in my name, I'm in the midst. Thank you for being here, Jesus. So I ask you right now, Father, to release your touch on each person where they need it right now to bring a healing, a miracle, a blessing, to bring a, a, a sense, an a, a, a incredible feeling of your presence and your joy and your peace and your love. Bless you, people, Father. You've already blessed us through Jesus. We just ask for more. We hang on to your Father and say, bless us. We'll never let go. We thank you that you'll never let go of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Have a blessed week.